Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Praise our God. Praise the Lord from whom all blessings flow. Amen. Amen. This morning, we're going to look at Psalm uh, 19. This 19th Psalm. We've been looking at uh, Isaiah and uh, Galatians. We're talking about that we know G that we're, uh, we we're in Christ. Uh, just like Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, then we're putting our trust in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when we believe him, believe on him, the Bible tells us that we are saved, we are declared righteous. And uh, this morning, I just want to take a look at uh, Psalm 19. Uh, Psalm 19. Amen. You with me? Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to have a time in your word this morning. Thank you, Father, for continuing to guide and lead us in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. As we look at Psalm 19, may it be a blessing to us and may it cause us to draw nearer to you, nearer to one to another, that we might be the people of God who will show forth your praises. You, the one who have called us out of darkness and a marvelous light. Thank you, Father. Have your way and bring glory to yourself. May we be continually built up in the faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Psalm 19. Okay, Psalm 19. Let me scroll down on my computer here uh, to verse 14. And uh, Psalm 19 and verse 14, okay? So I'm, and I have, uh, I'm using the New Living Translation. Psalm 19 and again, verse 14. So what we're looking at in that 14th verse, it says, may the words of my mouth, all right? And the meditation of my heart. The King James Version says, be acceptable. This version says, be pleasing to you. Now, we all know that Hebrews eleven six 6 tells us, without faith, without trusting in God, it's impossible to please him. For uh, he who uh, trusts him must believe that God exists, that he is, and he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So Psalm, four, uh, Psalm 19, verse 14 says, may the words of my mouth, amen, the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, my rock and my redeemer. He's, he's our rock. When he's steadfast. He's not like shifting sand. He's a rock. David said, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. So God is our rock. He's our redeemer. He's the one that's brought us out of sin. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. All right, that's Psalm 119, excuse me, Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verse 14. So, but how do we get there? How, how do we get to that 14th verse with that kind of... Uh, uh, worship, prayer, praise. How, how do we get there? Well, let's go back to Psalm 19. Look at verse 1. Psalm 19 and verse 1. And the scripture says, in the New Living Translation, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display His craftsmanship. His craftsmanship. Amen. And, you know, having an opportunity to this past uh, this past week, uh, I went to Dallas on Wednesday and flew back uh, last evening. And when you look at uh, the skies, the skies display God's crafty craftsmanship. Is is uh, elegant excellence displayed by the skies? The heavens go further than, than that. Okay, the heavens, the skies are a part of the heavens. The heavens just are, are continually or continuously existing in the, in the format that God has, has done since he created it. The, the heavens and the earth 
uh, are not, uh, well, you know, they're not eternal, but God brought them into, into place. And as he brought them into place, the heavens, the skies, the earth, what happens is that they declare the glory of God in another version. They declare his glory. In other words, his craftsmanship, his skill. Who could do this? Who could create uh, like this and put all this into place and, and start it up and cause it to continually move? Remember, uh, God said to Noah, he said, Now I destroyed the earth once by flood, but I'll never do it again. And he made a promise to Noah, unconditional promise to Noah and by uh, uh, application to you and me also. He was not going to destroy the whole earth by water. He's not going to do it. Praise the Lord. But when, when you look at the, the various things that we've had, tsunamis, earthquakes, uh, floods, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, and so forth, but it hasn't impacted the whole earth because we're still here. <laughs> Amen. And God promised the heavens proclaim his glory. So it, And so that's why verse 2 will say, Day after day, they continue to speak. Okay? Day after day, they continue to speak. Psalm 19, 2. Night after night, they make it known. Again, I go back to Genesis. God says, uh, because of the promise he made to Noah, that these things are going to happen. We're going to have day. We're going to have night. We're going to have the, the rotation uh, of the earth, the revolution around the sun. And they speak and they make known, make God known. Romans 1 tells us the same thing, that by his creation, everything is known about God, even his, uh, his attributes and all this. Because if a God, if someone can create the heavens and the earth the way he's done, that shows you that he is an omnipotent, omniscient, uh, God, and he's also omnipresent. He's everywhere. Praise the Lord. So first of all, the heavens proclaim the glory. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they keep on speaking. Night after night, they make him known. Verse three says, they speak without a sound or word. Again, Psalm 19, verse three, New Living Translation. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is never heard. <laughs> but the demonstration of, of the earth continuing to be where God has placed it and in the same situation that God has placed it, when you look at that, then it says, without a word, they're declaring the glory of God. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is never heard. You know, there was, um, I've read about Christians who, uh, before they could communicate to one uh, to anybody else, especially a lady like Helen Keller, a Christian sister, and uh, finally, you know, she was able to communicate with the human beings, uh, other human beings, and she, uh, someone told her about God, and she said, I uh, I never knew his name, but I knew he was there. I knew he existed. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. Amen. Verse 4. Even though there, there hasn't been a sound or a word, and their voice is never heard. Uh, uh, Psalm 19, verse 4. What does it say? Yet their message has gone throughout the earth, and their words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. Look at that. Praise the Lord. Psalm 19, 4. Meditate on that. Think about that. Notice uh, the message has gone throughout all the earth, the words to all the world. But in the, in the end of that verse, he says, God, the creator God, the one who's created all this, has made a home in the heavens. A home in the heavens. What's that all about? He's made a home in the heavens for the sun. The S-U-N, for the sun. <laughs> okay. Now, that, this is a picture 
that God has made a home for his son, S-O-N. The son, and when it comes to the heavens and the earth and comes to, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, our, our planetary system, our universe, the sun is the center of uh, these nine or ten planets, whatever, however we want to call them. And everything revolves around the sun. The sun is the center, not the earth, not Mars, not Mercury, not Jupiter, not Pluto. So it's sometime uh, not uh, the other planets, Saturn, so forth. Not any uh, God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. Now we take that and we say that's a physical understanding of uh, how God has created the heavens and the earth. But the spiritual understanding is God has made a home in the heavens for his son, his son, S-O-N. Notice verse five. See the poetic way that this helps us to see some things naturally, physically, materialistically, but also spiritually. It bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. All right. It rejoices like a great athlete, eager to run the race. Yeah, you, and, and I know you, you've seen that. If you watch any kind of Olympics or, and the, at the races and, and just before, I mean, the athletes are there. They're moving, they're jumping, they're shaking their hands and they're getting ready and they're stretching and they're doing all this sort of stuff and they're getting ready. These tremendous world-class athletes, eager to run the race. They get into the blocks, the starting blocks, and, and, and they're, they're eager. The Bible says that, that when it comes to the sun, the sun is like a radiant bridegroom, the S-U-N sun. After its wet, uh, wedding, it rejoices like a great athlete, eager to run the race. Verse six says, the sun, again, we're talking about the physical sun, which is the center of the of our universe, the her, the sun rises at the end of the heavens, follows its course to the other end. Nothing can hide, uh, nothing can hide from its heat. In other words, the sun hits everything. Now, this poetic language, uh, you know, people will sometimes be very critical of it, and they say the sun rises at the end of the heavens and follows its course. No, it's a, and, and people will say, scientists know that's not true. So what do you mean it's not true? Well, the, uh, the, the, the planets revolve around the sun. The sun doesn't revolve around the planets. And then, so the Bible doesn't make sense. Well, none of us make sense when we start talking about these things because uh, what we say, sunrise or oh, sunrise, okay, sunset. We say that all the time. And if we're going to criticize the Bible, we've got to criticize ourselves for being stupid. And you say, the sun doesn't rise and set. It's the rotation of the earth. <laughs> day by day, night by night. Yes, but we use that language. And the Bible is simply using the language about the sun rising at one end. And the Bible will tell us, at the, as, uh, at the rising of the sun and at the setting of the same, he is to be praised. He's worthy. Our God is worthy, worthy to be praised. And of course, that's just the language that is, is used. The Bible is not trying to say that the sun is revolving or moving around all these planets. No, they're moving around the sun. Verse 7 says uh, this, the instruction of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the symbol. Now, here's where we get deeper in, in the Psalm 19. We get deeper into uh, how God is revealed. Romans 1 tells us, starting with verse 18 to the end of uh, Romans chapter 1. Uh, again, it tells us the wrath of God is revealed from, from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who hold down and suppress the truth in their unrighteous lies, their living, their conduct. But so God through creation has revealed himself, created the heavens and the earth. He's, he's revealed himself. Not a word is said, but it's obvious 
that if you have creation, you must have a creator. You cannot have creation without a creator. So the creator is making himself known. Now we get to Psalm one nine, Psalm nineteen, rather Psalm nineteen, and we get to verse seven. So the instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. Amen. Praise God. I hope you're with me. The instructions. So we just don't need. We need more than creation. Creation reveals there is a creator and that he's a loving, kind creator. Creation reveals that he's a, uh, he's a creator who is still involved in his creation. We get all, all that. But the instructions of the Lord are perfect. Well, the idea of that is complete. So we're incomplete with just creation. Good morning, everybody. We're incomplete with just creation creation as far as the soul being revived what we need after that is the instructions of the lord or the law of the lord the word perfect means it it, it reaches the goal so uh, and many times we're talking with people one way or another different places and people will say to us you know i love nature i go out and i just feel so close to god and I look at, I'm looking at this and that. I get all that. But, but in order for you to have your soul saved, your soul sanctified, in order for you to be filled with the Spirit of God and to get to Psalm, 1, Psalm 19, verse 14, where, again, the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart are acceptable with God. O oh Lord, my strength, my Redeemer my strength. And another version says, my rock. Lord is on my strength. Well, uh, that's, yeah, that happens when I'm listening to him and I'm living my life based upon his instructions. The law of the Lord, uh, the instructions of the Lord are perfect. That's the goal. So if you want to reach the goal of your salvation, uh, of being saved, justification, sanctification, and glorification, then you need the instructions of the Lord. That's what revives the soul. And he goes on and says, uh, so, or, or transforms the soul. That's what takes us from spiritual death to spiritual life, the instructions of the Lord. Now again, 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that again, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. But well, first of all, for doctrine, which means to be taught, we have for instruction in righteousness. We need the instructions of the Lord. And then when we meditate in them day and night, as Psalm 1 says, what happens is uh, they make us wise. Because that's the, that's, that's the second part of verse 7. Now notice again in this, what's called parallelism. The first uh, line or the first uh, line and a half and the second line and a half are strengthening each other. So the, uh, the writer says, the instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. And he goes, he says, the decrees, which are the instructions, the, but the, he calls it another word, the decrees of the Lord are trustworthy. Man, that's a great statement. What God decrees, we can trust. His decrees, his instructions, we're, we're reading, we're learning, we're meditating, we're praying and asking God to help us get to the point of obedience. That's our Sunday school theme this quarter. Uh, if, for those of you who, who have the uh, expositor, the Bible expositor, uh, obedience, obedience, the instructions, God is instructing us. But the Bible tells us the decrees, God has also decreed things, he's commanded us. This do this, the decree of the Lord are trustworthy. And so when we meditate on that and you think about that, it doesn't matter whether you understand it or not, long as you know it's a decree. God has declared this to be, and this is how we respond to what he's declared. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy. And the Bible says, making wise the simple. The word simple has the idea that you know, we're naive to certain things. Uh, we're naive, 
but the decrees of the Lord are so trustworthy. The Bible will say in Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Here the word simple is the idea of someone who does is not double-minded. A simple-minded person is not uh, someone who's a simpleton, who's silly, who's dumb, who's stupid, who doesn't understand. The simple is someone who not doesn't is is not a person who's saying one thing, doing another, who listens listens to the word, but then comes up with his own understanding. A few years back, well, it's been more than a few now. What popped up on the scene? What came on the scene was was this. It was uh, a teaching, a uh, Bible teaching. It was uh, it was serendipity. So what, what what is what is serendipity? Oh, I just read the scripture, and we and we talk about it. Here's what it means to me. Who cares what it means to you? What does it mean? <laughs> what it means to you is nonsense. It's what it means. And so, as, as Jesus uh, says. Uh, that uh, he tells he tells Nicodemus, he, he said Nicodemus, uh, unless you're born again, guess what Nicodemus, you're not going to understand, you're not going to see the kingdom of God, and he says, and marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again, John chapter three, marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again, the Spirit moves wherever He wants to. And he impacts and inf uh, impacts everyone that he wants to. He's in sovereign control. But Nicodemus, you need to be born again. Someone, so serendipity Bible study says this. Jesus said to Nicodemus, I must be born again. Well, here's what I think that means. Here's what it means to me. I need to just be a better person. But I mean, that's not, that may mean that it may mean that to you. That's not what it means. <laughs> Excuse me. That's not at all what it means. And if you're going by what it means to you, you're going to be lost and you're going to stay lost because that's not what the scripture means. So Proverbs, not Proverbs, but uh, Psalm one, Psalm 19. I keep trying to say 119. Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Verse 7. The instructions of the Lord are perfect. We mean perfect. They reach the goal. What is the goal of the instruction of the Lord? To revive your soul. You're dead in trespasses and sin before you come to Jesus Christ. The instructions of the Lord are to cause you to be born again, to go from spiritual death to spiritual life. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the, sim the simple. See, if you're not duplicitous, giving everything a double meaning, coming up with reasons why you should not obey the word of, of God, James said a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And so the double-minded man hears, gets the word of God, but he twists it so he doesn't have to do what God says. You, find, you see what I'm saying? That's what double-minded says. So a double-minded person uh, needs to do a twofold cleansing, the cleansing of the heart, cleansing of the hands. So your service is messed up. Your service is messed up because your heart is messed up. And so people who are double-minded will often try to do a whole lot of extra work. Boom, you know, got, the, got these hands, I'm busy, I'm doing this, I'm doing... That does nothing to save you. You're double-minded. You're not doing what God says. And you're replacing the instruction of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord, you are replacing that with your own will, your own, the, the way that you, you want to do it. So those instructions and decrees of the Lord uh, don't make you wise because you're not simple. You're not simple also means single-minded. A single-minded person or a simple person is one who, when they hear the truth, responds to the truth by living according to the truth. So uh, that's the, that's the single-minded person. You know, when we got married, all of us who married, we, we, we pledged to be single-minded toward our mates, not, not double, triple, and quadruple-minded with four or five other folks out, out there. No, just we, we're, we call ourselves 
making a dec- uh, uh, following a, excuse me following our vows and we become single minded toward our husbands and our wives verse 8 the commandment of the lord so notice he calls it instructions in verse 7 he calls it decrees in verse uh, 7 and he calls it commandments in verse 8 the commandments of the lord are right amen And what we say, how do we know they're right? Well, just taste of the Lord and see that he's good. The commandments are right. They bring joy to the heart. And that's another another way we know. People are talking about joy. They do a lot of talk about joy. You know, oh, this joy that I have. Oh, joy, joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. And so when we come to church, we want to make sure we are joyful. And we want to demonstrate joyfulness because God has has saved us and delivered us and we we come to be joyful. And so one of the things that happens in a number of churches is that we're stressing, be joyful, get a smile on your face, get get a greeting and uh, say, praise the Lord, get your hands in the air, wave them like you just don't care. And again, that's okay. That's external. But the Bible says it's the commandments of the Lord that are right, bringing joy to the heart. So often what we're trying to do is get people who are not obeying the commandments of God to be joyful. So, and and it it never works. And again, that's that's what we say, they're, they're duplicitous. So now people are putting on a show. And after they do that for a while, they think that's all they need to do. That goes back to Isaiah's time when uh, the people of Isaiah weren't living right before the Lord. And they said to Isaiah, God don't care about all that. He don't care about my heart. He he doesn't care about me. Just as long as I bring these sacrifices, he's satisfied. Doesn't matter how I live. And so the same condition 2,700 years ago is with us today. But it says, so the commandments of the Lord are right. Number one, they're right. And, and because they're right, they bring joy, not happiness, joy to the heart. And then it says the commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Now notice that, uh, Psalm 19 and verse 8. The commandments are right, they bring joy to the heart. The commandments are, are clear. The commandments of the Lord, what God is telling us to do, is clear. It's, it's not like, oh, it's so deep, I, don't, I can't figure out what God wants. Sure you can. That's an excuse for not doing what God wants you to do. If I could just understand God, you, you understand what God is saying to you. You know right and wrong. He's giving you a conscience. And if, and if you don't know right and wrong, it's because you've been, been wrong so long and uh, you put God in a position where he has now seared your conscience as with a branding iron. So, no, you don't feel it anymore. It's like, you know, I I said in my hand when I was working at General Motors and all all the work, nine hours a day, six, seven days a week for years. I had calluses all over. I don't have them anymore. (laughs) I don't have them anymore. I don't work. (laughs) But when I was working, I had calluses. Uh, on my hand, and and the reason, and the, and those calluses, I could take a pen or a needle and stick it so you know so far, I wouldn't feel a thing. It was dead skin that that had uh, come up, and so if you don't know what's right and wrong before the Lord, that's because you you that's that's because your conscience is seared like with the branding iron, and now it's it's now no longer sensitive to the Word of God because You've been uh, duplicitous with, I use that word a couple of times. You've been double-minded with the Lord, double-minded. You know, a double-minded man is one who God says, here we go, do this. A double-minded man says, uh, I, want the, I want the blessing from doing this, but I'm doing this. I, I, I'm not listening to what God is saying. So, okay, well, you double-minded. Yes, well, I'm praying about this. Isn't that something? A lot of, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm praying about it. What are you praying about? So God says, be holy. I'm praying about that. 
<laughs> no, you need to be holy. You need to you need to receive that decree, receive that command. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you and make you obedient to what God is saying. Verse uh, so people who have insight for living, it's because the commandments are right. It brought joy to the heart. The commandments are clear and people are following. I always go back to my example with Samuel and Eli. And uh, so God, so Samuel was told by Eli, the next time you hear the voice speaking to you, then you say, speak, Lord, my servant is listening. The idea of the word listening, my servant, when you tell me what to do, I'm going to do it. That is listening with an idea or an attitude of obedience. And so well, what, what happened to him was that when the Lord spoke, he listened, he obeyed, and he went off to do what God has said. So the commandments, the commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight. The reason people don't have insight is because they're not going to obey the commandment. And many people want you to help them while they're out of, when they're uh, out of uh, obedience to the Lord. They're disobedient. And they come, can you help me? No, I can't help you. What you need to do is get right with God. Like we used to sing in, in church, get right with God and do it now. Well, what do you got to do? Down at the cross. Gotta get, get to the cross of Jesus Christ and put your trust in in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So verse 9 says, Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. Now notice, let me, let me read these verses to you. And so we get to verse, uh, verse 7. Psalm 19, verse 7. The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commandments of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. Each one is righteous. It reminds me of that of Abraham said, will not the judge of all the earth do what's right? Absolutely. Often it may not be right in our sight or in the sight of a sinner, but it's, all, but it's right in the sight of people who are in line with God. So reverence is pure. And now we know why people have our strive, what's going on in America and different parts of the world. There's no reverence for the Lord. There's no fear awe-inspiring fear for the Lord. That's what is pure. So when the Lord says, jump, we say, you know, we're in the air going, how high? That, that's what reverence is. Not when, not when God says, God says, jump, and say, well, why do I have to jump? I'm, I'm comfortable with right here. What, why do you want me to tell me what you, if you tell me and explain to me why you want me to jump, I jump. Not, in other words, God, you got to, you got to humble yourself to me. And then I make the decision what I will do based upon what you're telling me. So what is that? That is eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what is that all about? I tell God, you don't decide for me what's good and evil. I decide for me what's good and evil. No fear, amen, my brother. No fear, reverence for the Lord is pure. Well, again, that's where a lot of people have so many, so many problems because they don't have the reverence and the fear, the awe-inspiring fear of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. The law of the laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. Each one is righteous. Each law. And so what that means is we need to get the right attitude to get to the right altitude. The right attitude. What do you mean? We, we got to get our mindset right. Paul says when he's praying that, I, that God will give you the spirit of uh, knowledge and, and, and revelation, knowledge, understanding, the spirit of, no, of knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and the revelation of God. Because if you don't have the right attitude, you're not going to get it. And many people don't get it because their attitude is not right. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. Can we say amen to that? Amen. 
Can we say, not only because of the scripture, but can we say amen to that? Because we've experienced that the laws of the Lord are pure. Each one is fair. A amen, absolutely. Because God is a holy God, a redeeming God, and he's our strength, he's our redeemer. And because of that, he's created us and he's redeemed us. He's brought us back. Then all his laws are true. Each one is fair. Verse 10. They are more desirous than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the cone. All right. Amen. You got that picture? The laws of God, the reverence for the Lord, the commands of the Lord, the, uh, the decrees of the Lord, the instructions of the Lord. That's the idea. God's word is not just law. Do what I say. It's instruction. It's decree. It makes us wise. Uh, and notice here again, uh, and it's more desirable than anything else. Even the finest gold, sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the cone. And then the Bible goes down in verse 11. They are a warning to your servant and uh, a great reward to those who obey him. So you see the word of God. Again, notice this couplet. The first one, the first line and the second line. They are a warning to your servant. <laughs> Amen. The word of God is a warning. Uh, and so I, I learned a long time ago when the Lord saved me and I was reading Proverbs chapter five and, and a mother was saying to her son in the word in Proverbs 31 and 30, but in, Pro, in Romans and uh, excuse me, Proverbs five says, you got to be careful with the, with the kind of women that you running after. Be careful with them, you know, with the kind of girls you running after, because the end of that is death. <laughs> and I and I looked at that and I said, "My, look at that! It's a warning. It's a warning." Now you can argue that all you want, but uh, you go after as Proverbs says, and this is Solomon writing this. Who knows? He says, "You go after certain kind of women, and then you let that uh, dominate your life. You're gonna end up dead, man, brother. Yeah, it's a warning to you. The word of God warns us." And, but then also, it's a great reward for those who obey him. Ah, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Look, look at that. A warning, a reward. A warning, a reward. People who won't heed the warning want the great reward. Well, no, you can't get the great reward. You didn't heed the warning. It's a warning and a great reward to those who obey him. We, I know we all understand that because the day we're living in a time was called anti-lawlessness. People don't want to keep the law. They want to do everything but keep the law. They disobey the law. <laughs> you know, there, there are times when uh, driving my car and I get caught, you know, the light turns uh, yellow. And I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention. And I'm, oh, and I'm still doing 35 miles an hour, 35, 38. I can't stop now. I run the light and I feel bad. And then the two cars behind me run the light. <laughs> so, so the yellow warning light doesn't mean a thing. Because people determine whether I'm, whether I'm going to stop or not. And sometimes the light turns yellow and it turns red. And it's read for like 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. And you see another car coming through. Uh, or people will stop at a red light, you know, and then after they stop, pull off anyway. So uh, uh, the laws of God are a warning, but they're a great reward to those who obey him. So now verse uh, 12 says, how can I know all the sins lurking in my heart. Oh, and I look at this couplet, one, two. How can I know all the sins and then cleanse me from these hidden faults? And so the writer is saying, I can't depend upon myself to know uh, all the sins that are lurking in my heart because I don't see them. And so, but I, but I need to be cleansed. And so there are sins of omission, 
which means I haven't done it. They're sins of commission, uh, which I have committed. And so notice, so the psalmist here starts out, the heavens declare the glory of God. And uh, then he gets, uh, and when God gets our attention, then we need instruction, decree, commandments. And then, and then uh, and as, we, uh, as we obey them, transformation takes place. And then as transformation takes place, the brother or sister in Christ, the brother and sister in Christ, well, Lord, as, I, as I'm living my life, I, don't, I didn't see anything yesterday that maybe I've done wrong. But Father, Psalm 139, search me, try me. Is there any wicked way in me? And so how can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me. See, the writer wants to be cleansed from what may be sin in his life that he doesn't know. It starts out with acknowledging God as creator and then listening to instructions, decrees, laws, uh, and being obedient, listening to warnings. There are times that God has warned me. And, uh, you know, I'm saying, well, Lord, I don't, I don't see anything. I mean, you know, I'm not being convicted. Only that you're telling me, watch it. You tell me to watch it. Watch it. Be careful. Watch where you're stepping. And so, well, Father, you're telling me. I don't see anything, but Lord, since you, will you watch, will you help me to watch, help me to be the, uh, the man of God you're calling for me to be. And I agree with what you're, you're speaking to my spirit. And then later on, you know, uh, I, I still couldn't remember what was God saying to me to be careful, but I kept on and I wanted to be more careful than what I was. So what happened, obviously, since I can't see anything ever happened, I became more careful at the warning and what would have tripped me up didn't trip me up. So I look back and say, what was he talking about? <laughs> uh, I don't have to know what he was talking about. I know this. I didn't trip up because he warned me. So how can I know this, all the sins in my heart? Cleanse me from the hidden faults. Verse 13, keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then, see, see, here's the prayer. And so people who say, well, you know, I have a hard time praying. Well, that's because you're not really meditating on the Lord. Because you, the, the more you um, uh, are, are watching what God is doing and you want, and you want cleansing, you'd be praying a lot, a lot for you. Uh, Father, cleanse, my, cleanse, cleanse your servant, cleanse me from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then I'll be free of guilt and innocent of great sins. We have to be kept. First Peter chapter one, verse five. God is the one who keeps us by his spirit. And now we get to verse 14, uh, the, the end of this psalm. So I started out looking at, I read this scripture. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my strength or my rock and my redeemer. All right, so, and I started out saying, so how do we get here? How do we get to verse 14? Why, 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 why is he saying this? Well, to look at the, so we've just gone through the first 13 verses before we get to the last one. We get to the first 13 verses and uh, 13, keep your servant from deliberate sins. Well, how do we get there? Verse 12, how can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. How do you get there? Because verse 11, the word of God is a warning and great reward. The word of God is more desirable. So verses 10, 11, as we pray that, Father, I, your word says that your word is more desirable than gold. Make that true in my life, Father. I'm open to that, Lord, and I yield to your word. Your, your word is more... Uh, desirable than fine gold. Give me that desire. You know, Proverbs uh, or Psalm 37, trust in the Lord, commit yourself to him. He'll give you the desires of your heart. So what do we do? We, we, we pray about that. Heavenly Father, give me the, the desires of my heart. Make my desires the desires you want for me. And uh, so sweeter than gold, Again, the law of the Lord is true. Each one is fair. Reverence for the Lord is pure. The commands of the Lord are clear. The commandments of the Lord are right. 
uh, the command, the decrees of the Lord make the wise, make the wise the simple. The instructions of the Lord are perfect. Verse 7 through 13, uh, as we prayerfully read that, causes us to end up at verse 14. And so here's the prayer uh, that we pray based upon the Creator, His instructions, His law, His decrees, His warning, the great reward. So we end up praying, Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation in, in my heart, may it be pleasing to you. Oh Lord, you're my strength. You're my rock. You are the one who redeems me. So the word redeems me as the idea that he brings us out of sin because we were sold or we were sold in the slave market. Uh, we were in bondage to sin. That's the idea of a person who's not redeemed. He's in bondage to sin. He needs to be loosed from sin by the payment of Jesus Christ's blood. And so, as we may the words of my mouth, meditation of my heart, may it be pleasing to you, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You with me? And so, again, we started out in verse 14 and said, how do we get there? Well, 7 through 13 is how we get there. After the Lord gets our attention, God, the God, the creator gets our attention. And, uh, and again, how he's created the heavens and the earth. And once he's got our attention, now uh, we're ready for school. School's in. <laughs> School's in, my brothers and sisters. Instruction, my goodness. Uh, instruction, laws, uh, precepts, and uh, decrees. All that that God has given us, warnings, reward, school is in. Are we ready to get the, get busy and focus on the Lord? So we end up saying, you know, again, uh, day by day, week by week, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. All right, my brothers and sisters, praise the Lord. Have a good Lord's Day. And again, uh, words of uh, Psalm uh, 19, 1 through 14. And may the meditation of our heart be pleasing to God. All right, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for uh, our time in the word in Psalm 19. We honor you and praise you. May it be true in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, everybody. Thank you, my brothers and sisters. Have a good day.